Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll have a report from Guatemala detailing how U.S. beef exports are being expanded in Latin America. Plus, we'll head to Texas to learn why proper mineral nutrition is essential for animal health. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Ochsner. Thanks for joining us. Leading our news this week, the cleanup continues in Colorado where flooding last month resulted in lost lives and more than $2 billion in property damage. For agriculture, the flash floods were devastating. Cattle and horses scattered in search of higher ground, stored feed was damaged and growing crops were destroyed. In Weld County, Colorado, my own family had acres of land under water. Our pastures and facilities sustained major damage as the waters rose in this 500-year flood. We were blessed. Our family and our friends rallied around us, enabling us to rescue our cattle and neighbors' horses and get them out to safety without losing a single animal. Many others were less fortunate, however, losing crops, livestock, and in some cases, their own homes. Farm and ranch losses in Colorado will tally in the tens of millions of dollars. The Colorado Farm Bureau has set up a disaster fund to aid farmers and ranchers impacted by the flooding. To donate online or to find out more about the Flood Relief Fund, go to the website coloradofarmbureau.com. Turning to brighter news, U.S. beef exports are up 9% so far this year, valued at more than $3.4 billion. One reason U.S. beef exports have grown over the years is because of the great work of the U.S. Meat Export Federation. With support from the Beef Checkoff and USDA Market Development Funds, USMEF conducts programs in 80 countries. And, as Brian Baxter reports, Latin America is a region with growing opportunities for U.S. beef. The ancient city of Antigua, Guatemala was the setting for the third Latin American Showcase. The annual event hosted by the U.S. Meat Export Federation brought together meat importers and buyers from Central and South America to meet and strike deals with U.S. red meat exporters. I think uh, what you're seeing here in the third annual showcase is uh, probably one of the easiest evidences of what USMEF does in bringing buyer and seller together. And you know, we had record attendance. There's a lot of enthusiasm for the opportunities long term down here. Now we have in this moment 12 different countries from Latin America being represented here. So that means that we have processors, traders, uh, food service, institutional markets, retailers coming from all different 12 countries. So that means that we have been represented some way in all the different spectrum that we can merchandise the product in Latin America. The USMEF does an excellent job of bringing uh, decision makers to these conferences. And so we're actually speaking to owners of companies and decision makers of importers in these foreign countries. And when we walk away from them, it's usually within 10 days that we're able to achieve our first orders with them. The two-day event included education, cutting demonstrations, and a chance to sample grain-fed U.S. beef, which offers a new taste and level of quality in a region where grass-fed beef is more common. Uh, the potential is great, since there is uh, so uh, much difference in quality. The problem in, in our country is that it's not that we only have good beef. The problem is that we only have the standardization for the product. Oh, you, you never know what you're going to get there. But when you, when you buy uh, U.S. beef, you know what you're going to buy, especially if you understand the, the, the different qualities, prime, choice, or select. You, you're going to spend whatever you, you want to pay for the quality you are, go you are going to eat. We just see this as a larger outlet, a new outlet for our product. Um, our product is known worldwide for the quality it is, and. Uh, we just need to let the importers and know that it's out here and that we produce it and it's uh, available to them and we need to get the importers and the exporters together. 
From 2009 to 2012, beef exports to the Central and South America region increased more than five-fold to a value of over $134 million. And with continued effort by the U.S. industry as Latin American economies grow, so do the opportunities for U.S. beef. Well, the USMEF has really put a uh, great emphasis on this region over the last three and four years. And certainly we see a lot of, uh, of our companies, our member companies from USMEF, very interested in this marketplace, which has helped it grow by bringing more opportunities, more contact, more innovation into the marketplace. Some of them, they're growing more than others, obviously. The economic purchase power of some of them, to be honest, it is very low, but nonetheless, that doesn't mean that I cannot buy any product from the U.S. It means that it is just a different product where we can sell. Whenever the market share, for any reason, it is a small amount of volume in the market share, it means it's a great opportunity that we have to increase the market share in each of these countries. You know, it's a world market now, and we've got to be able to let everyone know we're out here and what we have, because everybody enjoys U.S. beef. From the USMEF Latin American Showcase in Guatemala, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Joining us now to provide more insight into the Latin American market is Dan Hallstrom. He's Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communications with USMEF. Dan, thanks for coming to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now, you've been involved with this Latin American showcase from the very beginning. Um, tell us just a little bit more about it. Well, it really started in 2010. Um, we became evident that uh, there was more and more demand for U.S. beef products uh, in the Central South American region. <clears throat> and the issue was that there was really a, a, a wide swath of demand. Uh, countries like Peru and Guatemala and, and Chile and Panama, if you look at the map, it, it's a wide uh, area to cover. So we were discussing what is the best way to cover this, and that's really where the showcase concept was born. Mm -hmm. So we started in 2011 in Panama, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it expanded uh, you know, from what was then about 25 buyers from seven countries to 2013, uh, this year, in, Guatema in Guatemala, where we ended up with uh, 82 buyers from 11 countries. Wow. And, and to give a little insight into what a showcase exactly is, it's a day and a half event. It really combines uh, social time for buyers and sellers to meet, mm -hmm. but there's also an educational component where we're teaching the buyers about U.S. beef. So what is the grain-fed concept? What is marbling? What is grading? Uh, what, what is the merchandising uh, opportunities with U.S. beef versus some of the other global alternatives? Mm -hmm. uh, this combined with a marquee event, the actual showcase itself, is a four-hour event at the end of the uh, day and a half uh, uh, time frame mm -hmm. where we bring the, all the buyers and the sellers together and, and the really exciting thing about it is in all three of these events uh, over the three years uh, there's been not only new business contacts made but a lot of new business came as a result of these events. Well tell us a little bit more about the specific markets within Central and South America that are growing especially strongly. Well there's some uh, traditional markets that are, are kind of in there every year. Uh, Peru comes to mind. Um, a big variety meat, beef variety meat market. Uh, you know a lot of tripe, uh, hearts, kidneys, things of this nature. They're, they're part of the uh, the culinary cuisine, it's a staple down in Peru. These are items that are not consumed or not heavy demand in the U.S., so the, so the mix, of the, it fits very well to add value okay. for U.S. producers. Uh, tripe alone uh, is on all, virtually every menu in some form or fashion. So that's part of the reason, uh, you know, Peru and other markets like Peru, where why tripe is worth a dollar, ten dollar, twenty FOB right now, whereas wow. years ago it was uh, virtually uh, put into rendering. Yeah. So anyway, you know, you move on, and look at some of the other markets. Uh, uh, Chile has really uh, come to the forefront. The fact that it's our number one market in the region, uh, it's a heavy uh, demand item uh, for the uh, marbled uh, middle meats as well as end cuts, chuck rolls and some round meats. So uh, Chile's come to the forefront. And then you have the uh, FTA countries, Panama and Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not only the FTAs, although it helps having our levies, uh, import levies reduced mm -hmm. uh, over a time frame in each of these countries as a result of the FTA, but the GDP growth rates in these countries are amazing. Wow. Panama varies between 11 and 12 percent GDP growth rate annually. Mm. Um, 
and you know people are like wow really and uh, this is an opportunity because their demands are increasing and US beef is a perfect fit and then you have some uh, other countries uh, that are smaller uh, and El Salvador comes to mind Costa Rica we're seeing huge uh, penetration into the food service sector and we're just starting to see it in retail as well so it's it's quite exciting can you quickly frame uh, what other markets around the globe are doing especially well this year well it's a it's an exciting year um, we are coming off of last year which was a record year in terms of revenue for US beef exports 5.5 billion in sales mm -hmm. uh, we're up nine percent year-to-date the leaders in, the, in, in that, besides the Latin America, would be Japan, uh, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. But our NAFTA countries, too, are stepping up. Uh, Canada business is up, and, and Mexico is down a bit year-to-date, but uh, in the month of July, we were up 16%, and it, it was our largest market a year ago. We'll probably be number two. Japan will take over that traditional spot at number one, but, but Mexico is making a comeback as well. So it's really, really exciting in terms of value. We're seeing a contribution in the month of July, a record of $273 a head. Uh, every uh, animal slaughtered, $273 comes about because of exports on a fed uh, cattle basis so uh, you know I, I think it's exciting what's happening but there's more opportunity out there and events like the what we're doing in Latin America are helping to add more and more value all the time well, 273 dollars a head in value is good news for all of us that are involved in the cattle industry thanks for coming and thanks for all you're doing globally for the US beef industry well thank you it's my pleasure to learn more about USMEF and U.S. beef exports, visit our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. Coming up on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. The wind and rain store mineral has been real consistent uh, as far as cattle's intake. We'll learn more about the value of mineral supplementation and how it can also help with fly control. Plus, we'll head to northern Wyoming to visit the Padlock Ranch, where the land, the cattle, and the wildlife are all managed with great care. Don't go away. We'll be right back. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD-TV. It's time to gear up for fall with big savings on John Deere hay equipment. Get 0% financing on mower conditioners, balers, and select hay tools. And for a limited time, get up to $3,600 off a new 8 or 9 series round baler. Plus, an extra $750 in-season bonus. So don't wait. Come in today before these gear up for fall savings come to an end. Though drought is eased in many areas, the effects linger. While forage and pastures recover, the impact on cattle can last longer than you might think, especially when it comes to nutrition and mineral deficiencies. Let's head to Central Texas to see how producers there are tackling these challenges. Cattleman and Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter has the story. Cow-calf and stocker operators in Texas and the veterinarians and consultants who work to support them have had their hands full the past few years managing through drought and trying to keep their cattle healthy and growing. Rain. <laughs> you know, everybody's hurting for it, but you know, you get a lot of, a lot of your flies problems. You got extreme rain and then you ain't got any at all. It's just uh, fighting the elements. Nutritionally right now, it's the, the drought that we've been experiencing here in Texas for at least three to five years. Some say it may be a, as long as 12 to 15. That's the biggest challenge for us is proper nutrition in these cattle that's economical enough to support the business. Uh, health issues follow hand in hand with the nutrition and problems that we have. 
With all the challenges drought and lack of forage create, one of the often overlooked needs is providing adequate, consistent mineral nutrition for the cattle. The mineral program plays overall very important in the health um, uh, of the animal and, and their offspring. Uh, so it, it is a very important part of the process and, and it's one that, that a lot of the producers, it's hard to sometimes get them to buy the feed and then the mineral, but uh, it is a very important part of their feed program. We leave a mineral supplement out uh, to, to try to meet the animal's needs um, as far as copper and selenium. We found that a lot of these cattle tend to be deficient in copper and selenium, which is having a real negative effect on their immune system. In particular, these stalker outfits, those cattle are stressed from the time that they get to these stalker outfits because they've just been weaned, they've gone through a traumatic event in their life. So anything that we can do to help promote health, like good trace mineral supplementation, is going to help us with the bottom line because if the cattle are not healthy, they're not going to perform, and if they don't perform, they're not going to grow, and if they're not growing, they're not going to be profitable. Even as rain returns and forage begins to improve in some areas, the animal's need for mineral supplementation remains, especially because the nutritional value of grasses vary widely. The fact of the matter is, stalker cattle that are forged on warm season grasses need mineral supplementation just like brood cows would in that same scenario. Our warm season forages many times are are forages that are resilient, but they're also resilient uh, at the cost of being lower in quality. Sometimes what we don't probably understand as well as we should is what impact the drought has on forage uptake of minerals. And if we're not supplementing these cattle with minerals, some of these calves that go into market channels may be severely depleted of uh, natural body stores of the, the minerals that are important to immune function and overall animal health. Don't go away, we'll have more on mineral nutrition right after this. No storm is too powerful for Neopurina wind and rain storm minerals, formulated with ultimate weather resistance. That means more minerals in the feeder and available to your cattle. Wind and rain storm minerals provide more consistent intake and balanced mineral nutrition to optimize herd health and breed back rates. See the difference at your local Purina dealer or visit CattleNutrition.com. Wind and rain storm minerals, another way Purina is building better cattle. New Holland equipment is built smart for the way you farm. And the T6 series tractors from New Holland are the ideal mid-range tractors for cattlemen. Whether your job is loader work, operating hay equipment, moving round bales, or pulling a mixer wagon, the T6 provides power and performance with optimal comfort. Choose from three four-cylinder and three six-cylinder models with the right combination of transmission, hydraulic, and cab options to fit specific haying or row crop applications. And T6 engines are tier four a emissions compliant featuring New Holland's exclusive Eco Blue technology. Visit your New Holland dealer to learn more about the complete lineup of New Holland equipment in addition to all of the benefits available to cattle producers. Let's head back to Texas and reporter Brian Baxter with more on the role and value of mineral nutrition. A number of producers have come to rely on Purina's wind and rain mineral as a proven product that stands up to the weather, is palatable for their cattle, and delivers the consistent mineral nutrition their animals require. The wind and rain storm mineral has been real consistent uh, as far as cattle's intake. Uh, these cattle that are behind me here have been here about nine days and uh, they've eaten about an ounce per head per day, uh, which might be a little low, I'm not sure, but these cattle only weigh 380 pounds. And being able to supply uh, additional medication through that mineral and know that they're gonna eat it consistently uh, ensures uh, some real peace of mind. We tend at some times to have a little wind out here, uh, and a lot of that mineral we've used in the past and we've seen competitors use will kind of blow away. And with this uh, wind and rain, we've got less caking on it. So if it does get wet, it's not gonna be a hard crust that we've gotta go back and, and pound on. Just like it says, wind and rain, you know, the, the elements don't, don't seem to harm it. Uh, the cattle seem to eat it very well. Um, 
and it's it's a, just a very good program. Again, you know, getting the getting the producer to buy into it, uh, but but once they do, it's something they keep coming back for. The wind and rainstorm product, in my mind, has revolutionized the way we manage loose mineral supplementation. And what I mean by that is when it does rain, it typically rains quite a bit. And the losses that we've incurred in the past with just traditional meal minerals has been astronomic. Uh, one of two things happens. Number one, water just stands there in the mineral feeder and the cattle can't get to the mineral. Or the second thing is that just the mineral sets up like a concrete block and the cattle can't eat it. With the storm technology on the mineral, it makes it much more moisture resistant such that when the weather event's over and done with, the cattle can still go in there and eat the mineral at the proper level and on a more consistent basis to get the nutrition they need, regardless of the weather conditions we have. In addition to providing consistent mineral intake, Purina's wind and rain also comes in a formulation with fly control, delivering another tool in the fight to keep flies from stressing cattle. Well, I hate flies like all, like all uh, cattle raisers do, but uh, it's, there's just a real economic impact on these cattle when you've got flies chewing on them all day. Aside from, from just the anemia and depression and everything else, the cattle are fighting flies all day. They're, they're sitting in the ponds or they're rubbing on everything, running around trying to get the flies off them and they're not out hustling grass like they ought to be. Fly control has been one of the really neat things we've been able to deliver through the mineral supplementation programs, particularly horn fly control is what we're trying to achieve here. And what it's allowed us to do is in a very simple, economical, and uh, really low stress, low management type situation, get control of a horn fly, which is a drastically negative thing in a herd, particularly with cattle out on grass in the summertime. It's, it's amazing how much um, money can be lost by horn fly infestation. Uh, if you think about a horn fly taking 20 to 30 blood mills per head per day, and you think about how many horn flies are on that animal at one time, you start to think, man, all the nutrition I'm putting in these cattle is being sucked out by the horn fly, and that's the last thing we want to do. So again, delivering horn fly control through the mineral supplement is a very easy, economical, and effective way of reducing the performance losses that we get from horn fly infestation. As part of an overall fly control program, wind and rain fly control gives producers the ability to reduce fly populations and the stress and performance loss they cause without handling their cattle an additional time. We were a little late getting started, but we were able to, uh, to fly tag and, and treat with a fly spray in April, which gave us about 30 days to get that mineral in them to get it really started working. But cattle stayed clean all summer long. I mean, it was, it was a real surprise to me. We use the wind and rain fly control mineral, and uh, we started using it this year. And I can tell the big difference in last year's cattle to this year's cattle is on account of, you know, the, your fly control. I think the cattle's performed better on account of not having the flies pestering them so much, and uh, you're not having to go through there gathering as often and putting your pour on on it. You know, it's just uh, cost effective and, and less stress on the cattle, in my opinion. Less stress and adequate intake of trace minerals can make all the difference in delivering a healthy animal that puts dollars on the bottom line for producers. In Central Texas, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. For more information about wind and rain mineral, visit the website cattle.purinamills.com. We'll be back right after this. You're not responsible for the weather, just the cattle. And Rangeland works as hard as you do to deliver performance, production, and profitability. Cattle need consistent nutrition. They'll get it year-round with Rangeland products from Lando Lakes. Deliver what they need free choice in weather-resistant loose minerals and mineral and protein tubs. Get the most out of your forage. See your Lando Lakes co-op for products that will stand up to whatever Mother Nature throws at us. Weather's coming in. Rangeland. Consider it done. Tough trailers built for tough country. Big Bend Trailers manufactures a different kind of trailer, one that's built to put up with the rough conditions found on the ranch. Rugged built using heavy gauge powder coated steel 
and a 2x4 rectangle tube frame. There's a 1 inch gap between the side and floor, so there's no place for water or manure to accumulate and rust. Big Ben trailers are loaded with standard features, a lever action hitch, a 3 foot escape gate and a middle sorting gate, rhino lining along the front edges and a receiver hitch to tow another trailer, chute or other equipment. Tough and practical, that's Big Ben trailers. Designed and built by a working cattleman, you can rely on and trust Big Ben trailers for their durability and convenient features. Reasonably priced for any rancher to afford. For a list of dealers and other design features, visit BigBenTrailers.com. Big Ben Trailers, built cattlemen tough. Every day, cattlemen and women care for their land and their animals. They do so because they're committed to leaving what they have better than they found it. One by one, we're featuring the 2013 regional winners of the Environmental Stewardship Award. Now, let's head to Region 5 and the winning operation in Wyoming. You'll find the headquarters for Padlock Ranch near the foothills of the Bighorn Mountains. Homer and Mildred Scott started the ranch in 1943 with 300 cows and 3,000 acres. Padlock is still owned by the Scott family, but it has greatly expanded to around 500,000 acres with land in both northern Wyoming and southern Montana. We uh, typically run about 11,000 mother cows, and we use a composite breed, and uh, these heifers around me now are, are examples of these are replacement heifers and they're about uh, three-quarter uh, English and a quarter continental. Today, Padlock is led by Wayne Fosholtz, who manages all the resources of the ranch with an eye toward long-term sustainability. Keeping the grasslands healthy and productive requires multiple grazing plans, since Padlock Ranch is made up of several unique ecosystems. The ranch, it is probably three to four ecosystems and of course all of that has to do with elevation and uh, rainfall and so forth. We have some areas that uh, will average around eight inches of uh, precip per year and we have some that could reach 18. So our cropping and livestock plans involve considering what all of those differences are. We've got the system in place where we have good people, uh, good people that know how to manage grass, they know how to manage cattle, and, and we rely on them to keep uh, track of all these different land areas that we have to manage. To better distribute water throughout the property, Padlock Ranch has constructed over 20 miles of pipeline. In addition, fencing has been installed to keep cattle out of riparian areas, stabilizing stream banks and enhancing water quality. On a really hot day, these cattle are just like you and I would be. They want to be in the water. And so when they're in it, they're tromping around, they're kicking up all the dirt and mud and so forth, and they're knocking off all of the banks around. So by protecting that, we keep the water quality better and it lasts longer. The ranch irrigates 5,000 acres of farmland, growing corn, small grains, and alfalfa to support the winter feeding program and supply the feedlot. Padlock uses precision agriculture technologies to increase crop performance while maintaining environmental quality. All of these efforts have the added benefit of improving thousands of acres of habitat for wildlife. Anytime you improve water or anytime you do things to improve the quality of the grasses, the uh, wildlife benefit. They realize the importance of uh, how these conservation projects help uh, their land for the future. It's not just for now, it's for decades into the future. Padlock Ranch has partnered with agencies like NRCS and the EPA on a variety of projects. One effort allowed the ranch to reclaim 450 acres of old mining ground, which was then converted into productive pasture land. Another major undertaking was the cleanup and rechanneling of the Tongue River, which runs throughout the ranch. We could see that there were places that were deteriorating and there were places that people had uh, used things like car bodies or uh, old tires and so forth in the rivers to try to keep them from getting on the farmland. 
what we've done is gone in and taken those out and uh, put in more natural structures with rocks and large trees and so forth that will help protect those areas. While the, the Tongue River in itself, whether it, it's how it looks may or may not in the short term impact our profitability, it is part of our goal and our sustainability effort to make sure that that thing is, uh, is kept up, that it looks nice, that it's functioning uh, as the watershed that it's supposed to. There's always something that they're doing that's, that's fascinating, uh, cutting edge, leading the, the conservation charge in, in some way. They have a real conservation mindset and it fits well with their production agriculture. They've demonstrated that the two can be paired together very successfully and, and benefit both. The gates are always open for groups that want a first-hand look at Padlock's conservation practices. Wayne also uses social media to share images of life on the ranch and to connect with people outside the cattle industry. At Padlock Ranch, they're committed to living as stewards of the land and have set a standard that can be used as an example for future generations. Sustainability will be uh, part of this ranch uh, forever. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's key to what we do. We're growing and raising these animals with the principles that are important to, to keep this ranch working for perpetuity. I see the results. I know uh, the benefits of being a good steward and taking care of the land. And just in the short time, 10, 15 years, you can see a difference. I think uh, our culture that we've developed on our ranch, our desire to everyone to do a good job and to take care of the land is really important. Help NCBA members improve the environmental sustainability of our industry by becoming a member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Just give us a call at 1-866-USA-BEEF or email us at c 2 c We'll be back with more right after this. Hi there, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory, and welcome to our farm outside Nashville, Tennessee. When we go to work, whether it's on tour or here at home, we wear the West. That's right. Where it's that perfect snap shirt or that perfect pair of boots. When you wear Roper, you wear the West. Learn more about us, Joey and Rory, and about Roper Western wear at eroper.com. Telling the truth and being real and feeding my family a home-cooked meal that's important to me. That's important to me and planting the garden and watching it grow. I'm Kevin Oxter, host of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Check us out at cattlemantocattleman.org or on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back. Scours is the most common disease among newborn calves. It can be mentally, physically, and financially exhausting for ranchers who face a scour outbreak. Merck Animal Health is working to ensure calves get off to a great start. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Dave Russell heads to Alliance, Nebraska to see how minimizing a calf's exposure to pathogens and maximizing its immune response can prevent an outbreak. Success in producing and raising healthy, profitable calves hinges on a good start. For cow-calf producers, their, their whole profit structure is based on calves. I mean, that's what they have to sell. And so having live calves, getting calves off to a good start is, is really critical to, to their success. So in the first 30 to 60 days, the major problem or challenge that these calves face is, is scours. Scours, or neonatal diarrhea, is an infection that destroys the lining of the gut, causing the calf to become dehydrated and unable to absorb vital nutrients. Once an outbreak has occurred, treating scours is not an easy task. One of the reasons it's difficult is because uh, a lot of times we're dealing with viruses and so, you know, our typical antibiotic-based therapies are, are not going to have any effect on, on viruses. 
Uh, the calves, the major problem they face is that they dehydrate quickly, they lose a lot of fluids, and so the main treatment uh, is aimed at trying to restore those fluids. So that can be done early on by uh, tubing the calves with electrolytes uh, for more severely dehydrated calves, and we'll, we'll put in an IV. It's a pretty labor-intensive kind of deal. In addition to a labor-intensive treatment process, calf scours can take an emotional and financial toll on a rancher. It's their job to get these babies started and keep them alive, just like, you know, your own kids, really. And so they're, they take it seriously, and it's, it's pretty hard on them when it's failing. When you get a bunch of calves getting sick, all of a sudden your workload doubles or triples. Everybody's working overtime, and so just, yeah, emotionally and, and stress, it takes a big toll. Financially, you've got the cost of, of, of treatment, the cost of, of calves that die that are, you know, not going to be there when, when it comes time to, to sell. So even the survivors of a scours outbreak, yeah, can have some, some permanent damage there so they don't absorb nutrients as efficiently. So they, they fall behind, they, they don't gain weight as fast. And so there are several studies that have documented that calves that have had scours compared to calves that don't are gonna be 20 to 30 pounds lighter at, at weaning. The viruses and bacteria that cause scours are primarily contracted through manure. Anywhere you have uh, have manure and, and mud and water to kind of help mobilize those bacteria, uh, that's where they're going to get it. So uh, one good way to pick it up is is off the teats. You know, when they go to, to nurse, if that cow's udder is dirty and it's got mud and manure on it, then they're going to get a nice dose of bacteria that way. Or if they uh, search around eating uh, little hay and things off the, off the ground, they'll pick it up that way. As a few animals in the herd get sick, then they start shedding much greater numbers of the bacteria or the virus into the environment. And so that, that tends to you have know, a snowball effect and more and more get sick. When winter weather conditions are harsh, cows and heifers are often forced into a small area to be watched. This concentrates the amount of manure, making scours even easier to contract. Dave Sturkel, manager of Snake Creek Ranch in Alliance, Nebraska, knows the challenges this kind of situation can have. This morning's um, just typical morning. It was zero degrees when, when the sun came up, and, and so everything that we calved, we calved through the barn. Um, we want to keep the barn clean and dry, but... Uh, that's a perfect world and, and we don't always live in a perfect world. If you're having a lot of calves, it's hard to get the barn as clean as you want. And the exposure to the manure is higher than what it would be out on grass, but uh, calving them cattle in February, it, it's, it's just impossible to have enough grass range to calve on and still close enough to the barn to, that you can help them calves when it's cold. We'll have more on protecting calves from scours when we come back. Respiratory disease is a significant animal health issue in the beef industry. It costs producers nearly a billion dollars in lost profits each year, and it's the most prevalent disease in calves older than 30 days. So why not prevent respiratory disease before it steals from your bottom line? Vista Once protects your calves with the most complete respiratory disease coverage available, and Vision Blackleg vaccines can add 14 pounds per calf at weaning. For further information, contact your local veterinarian or animal health supplier. It's the official monthly publication of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. The National Cattlemen is produced exclusively for NCBA members and includes coverage of the news and events affecting our industry. From Capitol Hill to the far side of cattle country, the National Cattlemen provides information NCBA members need. Every issue includes market analysis, feature stories, and practical management tips. Start receiving your copy of The National Cattlemen. Call 866-USA-BEEF or go online to beefusa.org and join today. Welcome back. 
Let's go back to Nebraska and reporter Dave Russell with more on preventing a scours outbreak. Even when dealing with less than perfect conditions, Dr. Hill says there are ways to minimize exposure. First, don't overcrowd your calving cows. If you calve in a barn, be sure it's as clean as possible. And take into consideration using something like the Sandhills calving system to ensure you are continually moving to clean calving ground in order to avoid pathogen and manure buildup. There's a system called the Sandhills calving system developed in Sandhills in Nebraska where you take your main cow herd, you calve in, a, in pasture number one for a week or ten days and then you, you leave the cows that have calved with their babies there and everybody else moves on to the next clean pasture. They calve there for a week or ten days and same thing, those that haven't calved move on to clean pasture. One important thing we've learned is that those older calves become the primary source or reservoir of infection. So keeping some distance between those, the oldest and the youngest is, is an important strategy. However, minimizing exposure to manure is only half the battle. Maximizing the calves immunity against scours causing pathogens is critical. Since calves are born with no immunity, ensuring consumption of good quality colostrum to build up the calves immunity level against these pathogens is critical. The immunity of a calf is important because essentially they're born without any immunity, okay? Uh, with, with human babies, there's a transfer of antibodies through the blood, and so when a baby's born, he has a nice level of immunity from its mother. Calf's not that way at all. It gets no transfer through the blood, so everything that calf gets has got to come through colostrum or through that, that first milk, okay? So uh, in order for that to happen uh, effectively, that calf's got to get up after it's born, get to its mother, and have a good good full meal of, of colostrum and in that colostrum then there's concentrated levels of antibodies that that cow has produced transfers them to the to the calf we call it passive transfer timing of colostrum consumption is critical only 12 hours after birth the calves ability to absorb protective antibodies from the colostrum drops below 50 percent so the sooner the calf can nurse and obtain colostrum the better and vaccinating the cow early enough to establish good levels of protective antibodies in the colostrum is important. By vaccinating the cow, we stimulate the cow then to produce higher levels of antibodies, and those antibodies then again are concentrated in the colostrum. So that's, that's how vaccinating the cow eventually helps protect the calf. A good timing is to vaccinate the cow about seven to eight weeks prior to calving, then by five weeks, she's beginning to move antibodies into the milk and uh, everything works out great. When choosing a scours vaccination program, producers should be sure it includes a wide range of protection. A good scours vaccine uh, should cover the, the breadth of, of viruses and bacteria that are important uh, that we know are causes of scours. And so there are, are several strains of uh, the coronaviruses, the rotaviruses, uh, E. coli, Clostridium bacteria, or some of those. So they need to have the breadth of coverage in a vaccine. And new technology and vaccine manufacturing allows the animals to develop a more targeted, longer lasting immune response. One of the most important features of uh, new vaccines that have come on the market in the last four or five years is what we call subunit technology. And it refers to the E. coli uh, antigen in the vaccines. This little model helps illustrate what we're doing. Uh, older vaccines that use whole cell technology just take the whole cell and put it in the vaccine. Uh, the bad part about that is that cell wall is made up of endotoxins and the less endotoxin we have in the vaccine, the, the fewer reactions, bad uh, events, lumps and bumps we're going to have uh, from the vaccine. So the newer technology called subunit, we just take the pili here, these little hair-like projections, and put them in the vaccine, throw the rest of the cell away. It allows us to get a, a more focused, uh, more targeted immune response. Dr. Hill says that a scours vaccination program should be a consistent element of your cow-calf health protocol, especially when cash flow is tight. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and uh, in this 
case a, a, a pile of money because scars are so difficult to treat. Some of these uh, pathogens cause sudden death. You don't get a chance to treat them. The viruses don't respond well to treatment. So it's a, it's a very important thing to keep in place. It's like going through life without health insurance. I mean, it's pay me now or pay me later. Um, I don't, I can't begin to phantom what a, what a 30 or 40 or 50 percent infected herd of scours would, would cost your bottom line. At the end of the day, Dave says a good scours vaccination program gives his calves the advantage he's looking for. It's just a step up for Mother Nature and, and when you have that storm and your ground gets wet, even on the Sand Hills method, you know, they're challenged with weather as, as we are. It's just going to give you a leg up for the duration of the, of the season with that calf. In Alliance, Nebraska, I'm Dave Russell reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. To find out more about Guardian, visit the website guardianvaccine.com or log on to our website at cattlemen cattlemen.org. We'll have more right after this. I'm an NCBA member. I'm an NCBA member because I think uh, as an advocacy group, NCBA has done some great things for our industry and I kind of feel compelled to, to give back some of what they've done for us. Because this organization is looking out for cattle producers. They understand what makes our cow-calf business profitable. Join me today. Join me today. Join NCBA today. Head to BeefUSA.org or call 866-USA-BEEF. Seventy percent of consumers want to know where their food comes from and how can we ignore them? IMI Global offers third-party audited source and age verification essential for export markets and specialty markets like natural, organic, omnivoric, Eskimo, or possibly recovering vegan certified. For quality and edge producers, to the big boys, any cattleman who wants to expand his market, you're not just buying this green ear tag, you're buying peace of mind. IMIGlobal.com Let's face it, you don't think a lot about your trailer hitch. You use it and forget it. We understand, but at B&W, we think about it. Short nights, long hauls, never ending chores. The unthinkable. We think about it all, so you don't have to. B&W, trusted. Living in town, boys, it's hard. Lord, it's hard. Even the dog don't like the backyard. Spent all my life on the back of a horse. And that's a life I'd be glad to endorse, except I've got a new baby and a kid starting school, and it's tough to pay bills riding colts and packing mules. And so we gave notice and moved into town, but it's, it's just for a while till we get to down to buy us a place to run a few cows. And a horse for the kid, cause she ain't got one now. And a place where my wife can look up at the stars and hear crickets and coyotes, not a chorus of cars. Maybe I'm dreaming. Dreaming's okay. They help an old cowboy to get through the day. And they give my old brain some time to unwind. Knowing tomorrow, it's back to the grind. And I'll pet my old dog before it turn out the lights. He's wishing like me we was elsewhere tonight. But for the time being, our dreams have to wait. Because reality comes every morning at 8. He used to break horses. He used to herd sheep. And he worked in a feedlot a while. And he grew up a dream and he'd buy him a ranch and raise horses and cattle in style. But time pulled a fast one, life took a turn. Dreams pulled the wool over his eyes because it takes more than wishing and working all day to buy you a ranch and survive. So now he sells saddles or vaccine or seed or writes for the Livestock Gazette. 
doing whatever it takes to stay close to the land that he'll never get. In ag economics or ranch real estate and his hat and his boots and his gloves, collecting his check as he goes down the road from the folks that he wishes he was. But he knows he's lucky to just have a job that lets him stay close to his roots. He may never own the ranch of his dream, but at least he can pay for his boots. This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. If you've never been to the NCBA trade show, you don't know what you're missing. So we asked some NCBA members to share what they think about the biggest cattle industry trade show. The NCBA trade show is fabulous. It is a place where one can spend time during the convention and you can get information that you can take back to your ranch uh, for almost every input item you use every supply you need, uh, you get the information you need, you can make decisions, you can understand what will help your operation be more efficient and it's all right there in the context of the cattle industry convention. First time I went I, I couldn't believe how big and the magnitude of it so I mean you, you go there and you can kind of see what's new no matter if it's equipment or or drugs from the pharmaceutical companies or it's, it's just a, like an eye opener, it's awesome. Mark your calendar for the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show next February 4th through the 7th in Nashville. Find out more at BeefUSA.org. For this week's Legacy Photos, we head back to the Padlock Ranch in Wyoming. Let's take a look. Don't forget, you can send us your own legacy photos by visiting our website, that's cattleman to cattleman.org. Well, that's all for this edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD TV.